Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, Mario tells us about an Italian family's aim to prove its painting is the work of Pablo Picasso. Later, Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close the show with the lesson of the day. But first... A family in Italy hopes to prove that a painting found long ago on the island of Capri is the work of Spanish artist Pablo Picasso. The family has been gathering scientific evidence to support the claim. It wants officials of the Picasso estate to confirm Picasso as the painting's creator. A man found the painting in a load of waste he took possession of as a junk dealer more than sixty years ago. He hung the picture in his home for a long time. Later, it hung in a restaurant in Pompeii, Italy. Then, the man's son, Andrea Lo Russo, began to investigate the painting that, he said, his mother described as ugly. He said he first came to think the painting was important after seeing a picture of a Picasso painting in a school book. Later, as a young adult, Lo Russo and his brother took the painting to Paris. They showed it to experts at the Picasso Museum there. They looked, and they said, It is not possible, Lo Russo remembered. The brothers refused the museum's offer to keep the painting for further study, he said. LaRusso said that his research into the painting's origin sometimes connected him with dishonest people. He said some people tricked him for money. One situation led officials to investigate him as a possible trafficker of false artwork. That investigation ended after he produced paperwork confirming his effort to identify the family's painting. After more than twenty years of trying, Lo Russo believes that recent tests carried out by the Swiss-based Arcadia Foundation prove that his painting is from Picasso. Luca Marcante is a trained chemist who started the Arcadia Foundation in 2000 to investigate artwork. Marcante said laboratory tests show the paints used were like those Picasso used in one period of his career. Most recently, a handwriting expert confirmed that the name written in the upper left corner of the painting is Picasso's handwriting, Marcante said. For the art world, however, only one group can authenticate the painting as Picasso's work, the Picasso Administration in Paris. But it has not answered a series of requests over the years. Marcante said that he is preparing to share the most recent findings with them. He explains it this way. You need to understand they get dozens of inquiries every day from private people believing they have found a Picasso. The Picasso administration 
chose not to speak to the Associated Press about the painting. Marcante said the painting is similar to Tête du Femme, a 1949 painting that is believed to be a Picasso. It is part of a digital collection overseen by Sam Houston State University in Texas. Adding to the mystery, Marcante said there is photographic evidence that Picasso visited the ruins of Pompeii in 1917. Marcante also said it is likely the artist visited Capri in the 1940s. But expert Enrique Malin doubts the painting is really Picasso's work. He said, from what I know of studying Picasso for thirty years, he would never do an identical copy of his own work. The only record of Tête du Femme is documentation from a 1967 book, which said the painting was in a private collection in Turin, Italy. Malin said there is no other evidence of the painting. Marcante called Tête du Femme a ghost painting because no one has ever seen it. He added, the only real one is ours, that we have examined in a scientific manner. Lorusso said that his family has not decided what to do with the painting if it is confirmed as a Picasso. Many people are asking about it now since news about the painting spread in recent weeks. We are confused ourselves, he said. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. A European spacecraft has been launched to explore an asteroid struck in an earlier planetary defense mission by the American space agency, NASA. The European space agency, ASA's Hera spacecraft, launched October 7th from NASA's Cape Canaveral in Florida. The spacecraft or probe, was carried to space aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Hera is headed to the asteroid Dimorphos. NASA crashed its DART spacecraft into the space rock in 2022 in an area about 11 million kilometers from Earth. The NASA mission was an experiment to test a method for changing the orbit of asteroids that might one day threaten Earth. NASA has said its own studies of the crash showed it was successful because the force of the strike changed the asteroid's orbit around a larger asteroid called Didymos. Data showed the strike reduced the orbital period of Dimorphos by 33 minutes. But the Hera mission seeks to closely examine Dimorphos to get more details on how the asteroid was changed in the strike by DART. 
Data collected by the ESA spacecraft will be used together with information gathered by NASA to develop future planetary defense plans. American astronomer Derek Richardson from the University of Maryland told reporters before the launch, the more detail we can glean, the better, as it may be important for planning a future deflection mission should one be needed. Officials from ASA have described the $400 million mission as a crash scene investigation. HERA project manager Ian Carnelli said the spacecraft was going back to the crime site and getting all the scientific and technical information. HERA's trip to the asteroid is expected to take about two years. Next year, the probe plans to get a big gravitational push as it flies past Mars. It should arrive in the area around Dimorphos in December 2026. Before it was hit by DART, Dimorphos circled a larger asteroid from about 1,189 meters out. Scientists believe the orbit is now closer and that Dimorphos changed its shape. Astronomers have also found evidence the asteroid is likely moving differently. Examinations of the DART mission have suggested that rather than being a single hard rock, Dimorphos was more of a collection of rubble pieces held together by gravity. Investigators have said they believe the DART crash might have completely deformed the asteroid. Ignacio Tanco is the flight director for the HERA mission. He told the Associated Press that some large rocks and other materials could still be following the asteroid. This, he said, could present a damage risk to the spacecraft. We don't really know very well the environment in which we are going to operate, Tanko said. But that's the whole point of the mission, is to go there and find out. HERA will be equipped with two nano-satellites. One will land on Dimorphos and capture data on the asteroid with radar. The other will study the makeup of Dimorphos from farther out. ESA and NASA will use the data to create plans for a possible asteroid strike that could cause wide destruction on Earth. Astronomers believe an asteroid wider than one kilometer, which could cause a worldwide disaster, is estimated to strike Earth about every 500,000 years. An asteroid around 140 meters, which is a little smaller than Dimorphos, but could still take out a major city, is predicted to hit Earth around every 20,000 years. Currently, there are no known 140-meter asteroids on a path to strike Earth. However, scientists have said only 40% of those space rocks are believed to have been identified. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn is here to talk more about his science report. Thanks for joining me, Brian. Of course, Ashley. I'm glad to be here. This week, you reported on a mission by the European Space Agency that seeks to closely examine an asteroid that was struck by a NASA spacecraft in 2022. 
Is the European spacecraft expected to land on the asteroid itself as part of the mission? So the plan is that the spacecraft, called Hera, is not expected to land directly on the asteroid, Dimorphos, but the probe will be carrying two nanosatellites. Uh, these are just small satellites weighing less than 10 kilograms, and they are designed to be deployed around the asteroid to collect data. Now, ASA does plan on having one of these nanosatellites land on the surface of Dimorphos. Um, it will seek to gather detailed information on the surface and also the inside of the space rock using radar technology. And if this happens, it will be the first time that any spacecraft or exploring vehicle has landed on the surface of an asteroid, correct? Yes, that's right. So astronomers are very excited about this possibility. There have been a few other past missions uh, by Japan and the U.S. that successfully captured samples from asteroids. And, of course, this involved direct contact with the asteroids, but no direct landings. And what other firsts can we expect to see during this European space mission? So one of the things the European Space Agency has said it is looking forward to as well is the use of a new technology that could be compared to self-driving vehicles here on Earth. Officials say the system is designed to self-navigate around the asteroid based on certain surface elements in order to collect the most valuable data and images for studying the changes that happened after the asteroid was struck by NASA's DART spacecraft. All right. Thanks so much for being here, Brian. Sure, Ashley. Thank you. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. My name is Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. You're listening to The Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. In Lesson 34 of the series, Anna has a decision to make. She is trying to decide what costume to wear for Halloween, a popular tradition in the United States. A costume is a special set of clothes very different from what a person normally wears. Halloween is celebrated on October 31st. People dress as monsters, ghosts, witches, or other scary creatures. They also dress as all kinds of other things, such as American football players, animals, and even objects such as a bottle of beer. People can get very creative with their costumes. Let's listen and find out what costume Anna might decide to wear. Hello! Halloween is very popular in the United States. Children trick or treat. They ask people for candy. Children and adults wear costumes and go to parties. In fact, there is a Halloween party tonight. 
I need my friend Jeannie. Jeannie! Hi! Hi, Anna. What do you need? Tonight, there is a Halloween party. I love Halloween. Are you going? I might go. I might not go. I don't have a costume. Can you help me? Dress as a genie. Great idea. I can do a genie trick, like read minds. Anna, be careful. Things might go wrong. What could go wrong? You might guess that things will go wrong for Anna. A genie is a magical person with special powers. A genie can make people's wishes come true. In English, we ask a genie to grant us our wish. To grant us our wish means to make our wishes come true. And in general, to grant something to someone means to give them something. Anna thinks her genie costume might also give her the power to know what other people are thinking or read their minds. But then again, it might not. Anna sits outside with a sign. The sign has the words Mind Reader written on it. People see the sign and ask her about it. Let's listen. Are you really a mind reader? I might be. Okay. Tell me what I'm thinking. Sure. First, what do you do? I study. I'm a junior in college. What do you study? I study journalism. Okay. Wait. You are thinking you will graduate from college in about one year. Well, yeah. That's the plan. I told you, I'm a junior in college. Right. Um, wait, there's more. You are thinking you might get a job writing the news. I might get a job writing the news? I might? That means I might not, and I'm studying really hard. No, 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 no. Uh, no, you will. <laughs> you will get a job writing the news. I will? You will. I will. I think. Anna changed her statement from might to will to make the person feel better and more certain about her future. Yes, but I'm not sure this person feels very certain she will get a job writing the news. It seems that Anna might not have the mind-reading powers she thought. I think she will find out pretty quickly that her costume does not give her special powers. The modal will expresses certainty about the future. We use it when we are sure something is going to happen. And we use the expressions it could or it might when we are not sure something will happen. Something uncertain often depends on things we can't predict or know in advance. To predict is to say what will happen in the future. When we predict, we make a prediction. A prediction is what we think will happen. There are accurate and less than accurate predictions people make about the future. Meteorologists are scientists who study the weather. They also make predictions about the weather. These predictions are called forecasts. Thanks to computers, satellites, and other technology, weather forecasts these days are more accurate than they were in the past. We can say that weather patterns, or kinds of weather that repeat, are predictable. So we have the verb predict, the noun prediction, and the adjective predictable. And the adverb form is... Predictably. Like Anna is predictably silly in these lessons. 
(laughs) That is a good example. Sports gambling is another area where people try to predict what will happen. When people gamble money or place bets on sporting events, they are also making predictions. If they make the correct prediction, they can win money. But sometimes a bad prediction can end up costing them a lot of money. Whether they make money depends on how the athletes play. And these expressions, it depends and it depends on, are very common and useful in English. Let's look more closely at these expressions. When we say, it depends, we mean the results or predictions may be affected by other things or factors. For example, whether or not your garden produces a lot of vegetables depends on factors such as the amount of rain or water, sunshine, temperature, and the condition of the soil or ground. And notice that we use the preposition on after the verb depend. We often add a noun clause after the phrase it depends on, like this example. It depends on what kind of phone you have. The noun clause is what kind of phone you have. We can say it depends on this, or it depends on that, or it depends on plus a noun clause. Here's one more example with a noun clause. The noun clause in this example has four words. It depends on how much you study. Did you hear the noun clause? What are the four words? That's right. The noun clause is how much you study. I think for people learning English, their success depends on how much they study and how well they study, like if they use good methods or ways to improve their English. That's right. And the free lesson plans that go with the Let's Learn English series give learners advice for ways to study. We call these learning strategies. I predict these strategies will help the learners improve their English. (laughs) And I predict that you will make another prediction about Anna. Ooh, my prediction is that Anna will change her costume to something else. Actually, that's not a prediction. I am certain she will change her costume because I've already seen Lesson 34 of the Let's Learn English series. What costume does Anna change to? We hope you will watch Lesson 34 to find out. And remember that each lesson has a pronunciation practice video and a lesson plan you can download for free. You can find that all on our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. Just go to the Beginner tab. Remember that you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Dr. Jill. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr.